And if your goal is to get done that workout as fast as you can so you can beat the buddies in the class, you're competing. If the goal is to really dial in this new rope climbing technique because you know with six months of dedicated practice, it will be faster, even if you don't know, it potentially could be faster, that's training. Willing to sacrifice results now for greater results later. It's the equivalent of like a track athlete every single time they, they compete in the 800. And every time they went out for training, they tried to best their PR 800 times. That sounds terrible. Oh my God. It, <laughs> and they're not going to get faster. Yeah. Instead of like working on some mechanics, working on some 100s, working on some starting drills, working on a finishing kick, working at um, running longer distances at their 800 pace with equal with dedicated rest in between. That's the way you get better. No, no 800 meter sprinter thinks that they're gonna get better by running 800s every day. What confidence is has nothing to do with winning or the leaderboard. What confidence is, is knowing that you giving your best effort is enough. Greetings. Hey Patrick, how are you? I'm doing good. Good. Today, we are going to talk about um, performance in the gym. It's sort of the simplest way to put it. Um, we talk a lot, and and in the in the book Chasing Excellence, a large part of it is is dedicated to sort of the bottom of what you consider sort of the development of a champion in, uh, or the pyramid mm -hmm. um, that leads to a champion. The foundation, yes. yes. So, and the foundation of that is. Um, I think in the book you guys call it, or you call it person. Um, another way to put it is character. Mm -hmm. Basically, all of the um, all of the traits that an individual ideally would have in order to build upon to become a champion, right? So we talk about that a lot. I mean, that's that's a good chunk of what we talk about. So I wanted to flip it a little bit and go to the top of that pyramid. Um, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is it is it strategy at the top or is it? Yeah, so the very top, the very peak of the pyramid. Um, so kind of the, the pyramid. The yep. pyramid starts with uh, the base, the foundational level, is who are you as a person? What are your character skills? And I call them skills, not traits, because yep. traits inherently mean that you're, yeah, you're, you're born, born into. Yep. Yeah, so these are things that you can develop. Um, hunger, coachability, persistence, patience, uh, dedication, grit, fortitude, all those things. Um, next above that is the process, is... <clears throat> truly what are you doing on a day by day but minute by minute basis for improvement and for our athletes it's scripted out we have uh five different things we focus on from training mindset nutrition and um actual training uh i said training twice yep. uh recovery recovery thank you um and we have actual protocols for each of those five which are incredibly exhaustive and detailed above that is ability, which is what's your clean and jerk, what do you run your 40 yard dash in, how fast can you row 2000 meters, what's your, uh, how many unbroken muscle ups can you do? And above that, the final piece of this whole thing is strategy, game day, game plan. So in football, it's, are you going to run uh, a, a lot of um, pounded up the middle? You're going to do an aerial attack over the top on defense. You're going to blitz them. Are you going to step back and play a zone in our sport? It's, are you going to go on broken? Are you going to go singles? Are you going to try to pace every round? Are you attack from the beginning? Strategy matters, but it's the icing on the cake. Yeah. Okay, so I guess maybe today we're going to talk about the, the maybe the top half of that then, somewhere cool. between the ability and the strategy, because some of it won't be, um, I think, specifically strategy. Um, I think it'll probably fall into the ability one. So I've got I've got, got some questions, um, and we'll see where they go. And 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 obviously, if, you, um, if there are anything that I'm not asking, fill in. Great. So the first question... Um, an athlete you've never met or seen compete tells you that she has a competition tomorrow and is looking for advice. What what sort of what can you actually tell this individual who you haven't really seen perform? You don't know very well. What sort of where can you answer that question? And if you can, what does that answer look like? It's because I don't know them. It's going to have to be a little higher level stuff um, or a little more foundational stuff than the specifics of like, you know, here's how much you be breathing. Right. Here's how much you cycle these reps. I don't know this athlete. Um, I probably give them a couple like broad things, um, which is what it's take one workout at a time. In our sport, we have multiple workouts in a day. You, the next workout can't affect what you're doing right now. And the last workout you just did can't affect the next workout. You literally have to compartmentalize and focus literally just on this one thing. Similar to that, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. It's all about what you're doing. Can you reach your potential? If you're just trying to beat the person in front of you or to the next of you, you're trying to clear 
a bar that's just imaginary. I want to know what you're capable of. What can you do? It kind of like uh, cliche type stuff, one workout at a time, right? The next would be to um, focus only on those things which you have control, right? So a lot of people worry about the judges no, no repping them. They worry about the workout that's announced that there is their weakness. They worry about um, who else is going to show up to this competition. You have no control over that whatsoever. You are really, you're trying to control the weather. It's like, let it go. Like yeah. focus on you and your best effort. But then uh, uh, really, those are kind of like higher level, yeah. almost cliche type things. But if you put them into practice, we'll move the needle for you. People look at them like, yeah, hey, I know that. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, and actionable are really like tangible, which I would give to almost everybody. There's a very rare person that doesn't fit this mold is relax. What a lot of people do before they go on the field, go on the ice, go on the court, or go on the gym floor. Is that what we yeah, do? I don't, I don't like, whatever we the do. The floor, yeah. The, I guess the, maybe the that's mat, the closest. This is another one. Like whatever. You, before you go to, on to compete, most people are like trying to get psyched up and pump themselves up. They're listening to heavy metal music or the, or whatever it is for them. They're you know having um, extra caffeine. They're you know pump them. Most people when they get on competition floor, that's not the issue. What we should be doing is the opposite, is trying to relax, trying to get as much into this zone as possible, what athletes call flow or in the zone. And that only happens when you're basically in the parasympathetic nervous system, you're resting and digest, you're not fight or flight, you're not, ah, like, you know, that can help in a very small sliver of competition. Most performance gains happen when you're more relaxed. So... I would do the opposite. I would listen to classical music. I would listen to light jazz. I would do breathing and meditation. I would do things that removed you from stimulus, not the opposite. What happens, what have you seen happen when an athlete tries to sort of pump themselves up before a workout? Like what what, what tends to be the result of that? So they're in this uh, highly heightened aggressive state where it's the fight or flight and a judge calls no rep and what are they gonna, how are they gonna respond to that? Like yeah, they're, they're, instead of like, like a judge calls no rep, it's like, I got it, bro. Good, got it. They they take the the onus off of their own performance and they're so geared up that they can't. Think of like, think of a, they overreach. So think of a baseball pitcher coming in the ninth inning of the World Series and before he goes on the floor, he's like yelling in the dugout, like yelling in the dugout and like a few sports this might work for, right? Like Olympic weightlifting, it might work for you, right? Um, where it's like this one small, instant, real quick burst. But tends to more likely to happen is when this pitcher comes in the ninth inning of the World Series. He's there to get nine strikes, you know, to get close to the game. He's going to he's gonna have a hard time throwing strikes. He's going to be throwing it higher in the dirt. He's going to have a hard time controlling it. And he's not going to make as good decisions because he's going to be so hyped up. Better is to go in like confident, cool, collected because... If you want that heightened thing, for most of us, it's there. The fight or flight is there. You are in a competition. There is a crowd. There is a leaderboard. Like that's not what. That's not the issue at hand. It's not harder to get hyped up. It's harder to get calm. The instance that um, I'm curious where, if you were to go back, you know, with this in mind, the gosh, not two years ago, Cole needing to. <laughs> win the workout yeah the rope climb thruster workout that yep. he won he came back from behind all that all the good stuff that most people remember is that the time that you would want him to be psyched up in a workout that's i don't know how that long that lasted but five minutes yeah where it was literally it was all or nothing it, it if he didn't win the workout he he was like is that the scenario where yeah being psyched up would be useful or even then do you think um calm so matters for Cole in that moment for that workout, and this is Cole in that workout, which was thrusters and rope climbs that's going to last two and a half minutes, um, it was time for him to run through a brick wall. Yeah, um, He had spent the whole weekend kind of um, in this rest and digest mellow state, and it was time for him to um, smash his face through something. Um, but that's, a, that's the exception yeah. that doesn't prove the rule. Right, right. Okay, so next question is, what is something that people, that athletes, that competitors are doing in the gym um, that is proving to be a hindrance to their overall performance when it comes to uh, game day or, or that competition weekend? Um, super easy question to answer. They're competing. Okay. In the gym, when they're supposed to be training and practicing, 
they're competing. So they're trying to beat the person next to them. They're trying to beat their previous PRs. They're trying to beat, <laughs> maximize their potential. So they're trying to go through workouts as fast as they can. They're trying to lift as much as they possibly can instead of the goal of getting better. It sounds like, well, isn't that the same thing? Is that how you get better? Definitely, 100%, absolutely not. If you're competing, you're gonna default to the most readily available movement pattern that you have, which might not be a good one. Mm -hmm. If a pitcher goes out to pitch and it's the ninth game of the World Series, I want him to do what he feels most comfortable doing. But if that's bad mechanics, and he's doing that in practice, like you're not getting better at your mechanics. The purpose of training, the purpose of the gym is to improve. The gym, the training is not a test. You should not be testing yourself in training. That's what competition is for. Every now and then we program in specific benchmarks to gauge our performance along the way. But those again are just little testers to see where we are. It's not how are you stacking up next to everybody else. And it's it, not every day. It's way less than every day. It's not even every week. It's it's more closer to every month. What we want our athletes doing is spending time in the gym, training and practicing, not competing. And most people are like, yeah, no, I don't compete. Well, when you get done, do you check out the times and the time compare them to other people? If you do, you're competing. If you don't care what the time is at the end, but you're there to get better, an example of this would be like, let's say there's a workout that has... Um, Coles, thrusters and rope climbs. And if your goal is to get done that workout as fast as you can so you can beat the buddies in the class, you're competing. If the goal is to really dial in this new rope climbing technique because you know with six months of dedicated practice, it will be faster, even if you don't know, it potentially could be faster, that's training. Willing to sacrifice results now for greater results later. It's the equivalent of like a track athlete every single time they, they compete in the 800. And every time they went out for training, they tried to best their PR 800 times. That sounds terrible. Oh my God. It, <laughs> and they're not going to get faster. Yeah. Instead of like working on some mechanics, working on some 100s, working on some starting drills, working on a finishing kick, working at um, running longer distances at their 800 pace with equal with dedicated rest in between. That's the way you get better. No, no 800 meter sprinter thinks that they're going to get better by running 800s every day. Flip the question. What is um, what are what are what is something that not enough athletes are doing in the gym that if they did do them, their performance competitively would improve? Uh, well, it'll be this the first one would be the same answer. They're not practicing enough. Gotcha. They're they're lifting heavy weights, yep. doing the sexy things. They're um, climbing rope. They're doing instead of if they're there to train their rope climbs, they're doing ten rope climbs for time instead of sitting on a box and trying to work on their foot placement and work on their clamp and then work on hips to the rope and then work on their slide mechanics down. So they're not practicing enough. But the next thing that like pops immediately in my head, which most, the question was, what is something that most athletes are not doing in the gym that would drastically improve their performance? Um, it's in the gym and out of the gym, which is dialed, dialed, dialed in nutrition. Hmm. The, our performance is, is mostly based on what we eat. What you eat causes inflammation or creates anti-inflammation, fights inflammation, meaning that you recover faster, you don't get injured as much, you can do, handle more volume, you have the right macronutrient breakdown. So you're fueling your body and rebuilding muscles and hormonally setting your body up for success. It's, by, it's the base of everything we do is nutrition. And people are either in the mentality that like I train four to six hours a day, it doesn't really matter, I'm gonna burn it up anyway, I just need the fuel. Or they're like, I eat, I eat good, I mm -hmm. eat clean, and they don't know what eating super clean actually mm -hmm. could be. You know, there's there's different levels of clean, and eating um, just clean, no junk, is one level. But then eating for performance is another, and it's like everything from getting your sweat analyzed so you know how much electrolytes and what electrolytes to have and how much and how much fluid you should have every hour you're working out based off of the humidity and the. It, I'm not going to go into that. That's a whole podcast by yeah. itself, but dialing it in. Yeah. And it moves the needle huge. What about the, and I, I have no idea if this is even true at all, but but people often say that, you know, the top CrossFit Games athletes don't eat paleo or eat clean mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, we've we've all seen the videos of, of Rich eating peanut butter and jelly sandwich, mm -hmm. whatever it is. 
are they anomalies or is that no, it's, not true? <laughs> um, um, neither. Yeah. Um, so there's a difference between eating for health, which is what I do because I want to, yep. I want to live to 100 and be skiing with my grandkids when I'm 100. Um, probably great grandkids at that point. That's different than optimizing performance for right now at this moment. Um, to optimize performance right now at this moment, I would do a lot more training volume, which might not be good for me later on in life. I would also be having different food choices, like before, during, and after my training, I would have pure dextrose, pure sugar. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible fuel source. Like, why would you not, like, you're gonna fuel, you're gonna fuel your body optimally for the stresses we're putting on in this workout by doing that. Replace muscles, like, immediately, like, uh, phenomenal. But in the long term, like, dextrose is bad for you. It's like, good for the workout, bad for your health long-term. So that's why they're different. Rich having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, that's a pretty solid, so jelly, like pure fructose, mm -hmm. like pretty solid choice. Like you have some, put it on some bread, like whether it's white bread, now you got some even more carbohydrates really quickly absorbing, or even it's on a slower burn, now you got this slower burn, so you got fast and slow burning carbs. You a little bit of fat in there, like for peanut butter, would be my choice. Yeah. You know, I would I would not do um, fat intro workout type stuff, but if that's his after dinner snack, like I get it, that's not a bad choice for an athlete that's trying to optimize performance for today. Mm -hmm. Very different than me or you. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, okay, so series of questions, all very related, but but looking at sort of different things happening in the gym. So um, things like. How do I string more muscle ups together? And again, yeah. all the, these questions all under the the sort of the guise of um, what can somebody do this week to make some kind of gains? Uh, you know, if they were to compete this weekend, like what are some things that they could do? Yeah. So things like stringing muscle ups together, or even maybe even just getting mu muscle ups if there's something related there. So getting better at muscle ups, getting better better yeah. at muscle ups, um, getting better at double unders yeah. uh, or triple unders because hmm. that's possibly coming. Um, and and you know other things like how do I get stronger? How do I how do I improve my endurance? So maybe we can just sort of walk down the line of the the things that. Any advice you would be able to give that we can sort of start to chip away at the the various things a competitor is, is inevitably going to see in a competition. Okay, so uh, let's start with the specifics. Let's start yep. with the, the muscle up one. Um, and again, this is me not having seen the athlete, so I have to just give broad brushstroke yeah. advice on what we're looking for in muscle ups. And that's how it. If you want to string together more muscle ups, you want to get your first muscle up. You want to get better at muscle ups. It's a mechanics play most of the time. I'm assuming that they have one or two muscle ups. If they don't, it could be a strength issue. If it's a strength issue, it's a totally different protocol. So what we need to do whenever we do this is root the cause. Like, why can you not do it? Is it because it's a strength? Is it because it's a technique thing or um, a mobility thing or a neurological thing? Um, so let's assume that they have a couple. So they have the prerequisite strength to do muscle ups. So we can talk about the technique portion of it. Mm -hmm looping more of them together, which was the original question. Um, some things I would definitely start with is um, where is their head when they're, they initiate the pull on the rings? Most people are staring up at the ceiling. They should be looking straight ahead. If you look up at the ceiling, you're going to put an arch in your back and you lose a hollow position. If you look straight ahead, think chin tucked down to your chest more, you will create more of a hollow position. So that doesn't really matter. Quick, first one is look straight ahead. Next one is um, keep your legs straight. Most people do the opposite where they do this big, huge hinge in the hips and in the knees where they're literally trying to like get themselves up into like a chair, put their feet up on a ledge. Yep. You should be trying to keep your legs as straight as possible as you come from that back kip, that Superman position in through legs passing straight underneath the rings. And literally when they're behind you, they're, perf they're straight, straight, perfectly straight. They come back through middle if you're watching a video and you paused it, they should be hanging hands, head, hips, uh, shoulders, hips, heels, all in a straight line. And then as it passes through, their legs should stay completely straight. We're trying not to create a hinge in the hip. We're trying to find a hollow position, kind of where you bring your ribs towards your hips. And then the next thing I would do is how um, high are they bringing their, knee, their, their feet? The idea is once you can see, because now you're looking straight ahead, once you can see your feet, you're trying to stop, immediately stop the momentum of your feet, and that will pop your hips up vertically to come up and over the rings. 
It's think about like riding a skateboard and the bigger your back hip, the faster you're going on the skateboard. And all of a sudden you hit like a pebble in the road. The skateboard stops, your feet stop, and you go flying. The momentum. The momentum. Yep. That's the idea. So said backwards the other way, from the ground up, keep your legs straight, keep your knees straight, hips straight, find a hollow position through your hips, keep your head looking straight ahead, stop your feet once you can see them. And do you recommend that people work just on that, the swing to keep the hollow position before they... Yeah, so the protocol, um, so that was for like, I think you yeah, said for a competition exactly, tomorrow. Yeah. But if we were to build into this, yep. um, I would have people build into 10 sets of, 10, build to it, not tomorrow, go do it, but build up to where they can do 10 sets of 10 kip swings where they're finding an arch to hollow, arch to hollow. Cool. With straight arms. Arms stay straight the whole time. You're not trying to do that thing where people pop up and get their chest or rings to belly button. You are hanging through the whole time. Gotcha. Um, double unders, triple unders, similar similar questions. Okay. Similar. So double unders, having never seen them, don't know where you are, but I'm assuming that you have one or two. Even if you don't have one or two, it's the same protocol. To so get from um, zero to one or from technique wise, it's the same. The protocol on how to extend them is a little bit different. We have to find out is limiting factor your technique or your stamina in this play. It's not a, a strength thing, it's a stamina play for double unders. Um, so the technique portion of it, the f starting from, um, first place I would start is with the hands, because if the hands are right, the feet can't be right. And where I would go with the, the hands is your hands um, should be below your waist. Most people are doing this thing where their double unders are, their elbows are tucked, everyone's was cued for some reason, keep your elbows tucked to your side and hands out. Your hands should be as low as you possibly can. The way your body sets up and the way it works is the muscles of your core are very, very strong, but they're extremely slow. Think about like your hips, right? When you squat, really strong, but you're moving that thing really slowly. Well, the, as you work your way out from core to extremity, from your midsection out towards your arms, your shoulders are faster than your abs, but they're not strong. Then from your shoulders to your biceps, your biceps can be, you can move your forearm faster than you move your upper arm. And then you get to your fingers and your wrists, they're really, really fast, but they're not strong. Yep. You're holding a, a rope that weighs a quarter of a pound. Like you don't need to be strong, you need to be fast. So let's not put this in your shoulders or your elbows, put it in your wrists. You do that by keeping your arms as straight as you can. So your arms should be really, really straight. The straighter, the better. If you watch, I believe her name is Molly Metz. Um, and she's, I think if, you're right. if she's not a world record holder, she's really, really, really good. Yep. <laughs> um, and it's uh, how long can, it's not how many can you do, but just how long can you do double unders without stopping? And people are like, oh, my buddy's so good at double unders. He can do, you know, 300 double unders unbroken. My buddy can do, no, my buddy can do 500 double unders unbroken. Molly does 10 minutes of unbroken double unders. If you're getting the normal protocol is like, two reps a second, mm -hmm. that's 120 a minute, she's getting 1,200 unbroken. Is that right? Am I right? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. I think so. 12, whatever. She can do over 1,000 unbroken <laughs> easily. And she gets done and she's like, that was good. Yeah. Arms are totally locked out, pinned right down by her sides. So that's the first one is get your arms and hands in the right place. Think about drawing tight. Imagine if you had like a whiteboard markers, not the jump ropes, but whiteboard marker markers in your hands and whiteboards right off your thighs. Draw the tiniest little circles you can hmm. with your wrist. The bigger the circles, the worse you're doing. Gotcha. And then from there, we work ourselves from the waist down. You want to um, keep your legs totally straight in the air. They're obviously gonna bend when you land, but it's like a little pogo where your heels kiss the ground. You pop up and your legs are gonna lock out as the rope passes underneath. So you're saying in a completely straight line, there is no heel tuck, there is no pike in front, there is no tuck jump whatsoever. So there is no movement from the heels, the knees, or the hips. When you are extended in the air, you are in a vertical straight line. It's just a little pogo action through your feet as you go through it. And if you keep the rope down low, you don't need to jump very high. The rope is only an eighth of an inch tall. That's how high you need to jump. You need to jump an eighth of an inch. You just have to jump in the air long enough for it to pass under twice. It's not how high you have to jump, it's how long you have to be in the air. So you can shorten that up by a faster turn. Mm -hmm. The faster turn happens in the wrists, not in the elbows. Gotcha. Um, triple unders worth getting better at at this stage of the, the sort Depends of the on where you are. If, you're, if you are a CrossFit Games athlete, yes, you gotta get good at everything. You gotta get good at paddle boarding, you gotta get good at pegboarding, you gotta get good at 
um, climbing a mountain with a rec bag on your back. You got to get good at everything. So for sure, um, for the regular everyday athlete, I would say it's a fun party trick. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably not something you need to spend a ton of time on. If you can do 200 unbroken double unders, I'd say you're ready to start playing with triple unders until then, like just focus on the double unders. Anything special about the triple unders worth talking about or is it? No, it's the same deal where you're, um, the faster you can whip the rope, the less high you have to jump. So what people end up doing is they like, I'm doing triple unders. So jump super high. <laughs> they even up, do have a bigger circle with their arms yep. and then end up having to jump even higher. Yep. So the feet are going to follow the hands in this situation. So if you can keep it a fast turn with the wrists, you don't have to jump as high. The only um, exception I might make there is as you um, go from singles, as you go from doubles to triples to quads, um, you it, it you can bend your knees up to allow more um, um, margin for error. Mm -hmm. If you bring your knees up, you spend more time in the air and your feet aren't there to get chipped on, chipped on the rope as easily. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, sort of broad, so take this where, where you, you want to, but cycling reps or doing um, touch and go reps? Yeah. How, how do you begin to be able to do that efficiently? Um, I, would, I would say it starts with your grip. It starts with being able to reestablish a hook grip on the way down. Um, so some people are, um, have trained enough or um, through their background are fortunate enough to have good mobility, be able to maintain a hook grip in the overhead position of um, a clean particularly, um, or even a snatch. A snatch is actually probably easier of the two to hold onto the hook grip. Um, but if you can't do that, it's being able to reestablish the hook grip on the descent. And you do that during free fall. Mm -hmm. So as you're coming off of your shoulders or from that overhead position and the bar is returning to the ground, can you reestablish the hook grip and then find a good position on the way down? After the grip, the next thing I'd focus on is making sure that you are um, setting yourself up in the proper starting position because as you start to cycle, the thing that gets lost most of the time is you're not setting yourself up. You're getting too far over the bar. Set another way is your butt is too high. Set another way is your legs are too straight. So on the way back down, you need to bend your knees is the easiest cue and sit your butt down lower to get a little more squatty. Mm -hmm. That's a really specific cue that uh, might not be appropriate for everybody, because but that's generally what happens as people start to rep through the stuff. Um, the next thing I would focus on, or these are probably not A, B, C, or step yeah. one, two, three, they're all together, is um, not being sloppy. People mm -hmm. now I'm cycling and they're going to try and go as fast as they possibly can. Try and build in. Th there's a reason that mechanics are important. They are the most efficient way to move, period. Whether it's a barbell or move an external load or move yourself or whatever it is. You need to focus on those proper mechanics, whether you're trying to cycle fast or just do a one rep max. So I would try to get um, where you're still continuing to, if it's the snatch, you know, you're trying to still pull the bar in, engage the lats, find the pockets, hit that extension, you know, pull yourself under the bar, not um, pull the bar up, all those normal things of bar path position, statics, uh, uh, set up grip all the rest would you um when you talk about go bringing it back down and reestablishing that starting position or is when you're doing it for reps and uh, presum presumably at a lighter weight are you looking I ideally to get to the same starting position as you would if you were doing a, a weightlifting session where you were doing cleaning jerks for um not for reps but for for weight yeah for the answer is weight. yes okay yeah the, the the optimal positions are the optimal positions okay. regardless if you're doing um grace if you're trying to do now there's little deviations here let's say grace which is for those that aren't in crossfit and i'd be shocked if people are still listening <laughs> to this and not across um it's 30 clean and jerks as fast as you can yep. there's little kind of uh i don't want to say shortcuts but little places you can take advantage of so the starting position um on the clean is still gonna be the starting position on the clean but the starting position of the jerk is actually the receiving position of the clean. So you're not going to finish the clean. You're going to transfer the clean into the jerk. Mm -hmm. So um, generally speaking, the starting positions, and the fist positions are the same. The bar path throughout is the same. But there's these little kind of like nuancey things you can take advantage of. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for... Let's 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 keep it with this sort of the event. Like I, I've got an event this weekend or a competition, yep. and one of the events has either a rower or a or a, or a bike or a true form or you know what so, some sort of you know of the uh, some device that we often use in the gym. Yeah. 
And now you've got to sort of maximize that in a, in a competitive event. What advice do you have for tackling events that have those sort of, so, sorts of things in them? Um, so if we knew the event, we could uh, give a lot more specifics to it. If I knew the event and the athlete, it would be a lot more specific. Yep. But broadly speaking, uh, the biggest thing to recognize is, are we going for distance or for energy expenditure? Are they measuring, is the task to complete 500 meters or 50 calories? And that's going to dictate basically the whole approach. Regardless if it's a uh, bike or a rower, if it's for distance, cruise, bro. Like this is your chance to catch your breath. Mm -hmm. You have to work so hard. So, And anybody that's been on a rower has experienced this. If you're rowing a 145, for a normal person in a, that workout, that's like, a, a, you know, for a fit person, that's kind of a guy, that's a normal place to be in three rounds for time, 500 meters. That would be a seven minute um, 2K. That's a normal pace. You have to work so hard for so long to get that down to 135. Mm -hmm. That's 10 seconds you gained. The person that's rolling 145 is probably going to beat you in transition to the next movement. Now, if it's 500 meters for time, that's it. It yep. doesn't matter. Yep. You got to go. But the biggest thing is um, recognize if it's for calories or for distance because distance is measured linearly and it's a chance to catch your breath you won't get it back if you work extra hard for me for calories it's the opposite for calories if it's 50 meters and you cruise you're gonna be on that thing for a very long time that's the time to put in that becomes way 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 more important particularly if you're a big powerful dude um so for example if let's say we're doing like a workout that was uh one round of Cindy, right? Which is five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 15 squats. And we're doing a 20 calorie row. So the workout is five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 15 squats, 20 calorie row. And we're gonna do that for five rounds. If you have a big, huge, super powerful dude who's not very good at pull-ups, push-ups, or squats, but can hammer the row, there is a, there's no way a little ninja dude who will cruise, rip through five, 15, five butterfly pull-ups, 10 quick little push-ups, and lightning fast air squats will beat the other dude. Mm -hmm. He can't do it because he can't make it up because when it's measured in energy expenditure, it's, it's exponential. And that dude, when he's rowing 1,800 calories an hour, is gonna go done it so fast compared to the other little dude who's rowing 1,150. It will not even be a contest. The guy could literally break up his push-ups in sets of two, and take a break on the squats, and I promise you, the big dude wins. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, last question is, for those athletes listening who don't have access to a coach, um, or don't have an access to a sort of a competitive coach, let's mm -hmm. say, um, what can they do to uh, improve knowing that they don't have somebody sort of with their eye, with eyes on them to either help technique or work on program, whatever it is? Um, what kind of advice can, do you give to an athlete who is sort of lacking that, that resource? Take ownership. You gotta be the coach. I mean, if you, if you, if you don't, if you don't have a coach and you say, I can't get a coach first off, like if you don't have a coach and you want one, like go find one, like mm -hmm. you can find, there are people that are willing to coach people. Um, but if you truly don't have that capability, which with the internet now, I, I find hard to believe, um, then you have to take ownership. You video yourself using a thing like uh, Coach's Eye, or I don't even think of another ones that are like it, but like a, a, an app that costs like either free or four dollars a month that you can slow motion, you can freeze frame, you can draw a vertical line, you can draw any sort of lines. Use an app like Coach's Eye, and then go on YouTube and and click on slow motion dot 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 mm -hmm. slow motion muscle ups slow motion, um, clean and jerk, slow motion, um, Usain Bolt, 100 meter sprinting, slow motion swimming, or tutorial swimming, tutorial sprinting, tutor and educate yourself. Mm -hmm. And watch them versus you and try to figure out where the faults are. And then from there, break it down. Don't try and get better at the whole thing. If you have trouble missing um, the... Um, the, your pockets on the snatch. Don't try and get better by doing snatch. Do a bunch of 
tall snatches or high hang snatches and then work from the hang and work from the low hang and work on um, snatch pulls where you're working to break it down in its little compartmental pieces and then layer it into the bigger and bigger stuff. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So that was the last question, but we do have one more thing for this episode, which is a sneak peek at a new podcast from Comp Train. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, I think we're calling it Comp Train Radio. Comp Train Radio. All right. So um, when we post this podcast, Comp Train Radio will also be live, but we're going to play the first episode of Comp Train Radio right now. Uh, and it's very short, so you're not going to have to wait that long. Um, but if you want more, head over wherever you get uh, wherever you get your podcast, subscribe to Comp Train Radio, and we'll be loading those up. Enjoy. Go get it. You're listening to Comp Train Radio. Mike Tyson had a saying, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Here's the only thing we can be certain. Things will not go according to plan. We're going to get punched in the mouth. It will happen when our judge loses count, when we get a no rep for no reason. When the monitor doesn't turn on, the collars slip off, or our shoes come untied. It will happen when we don't get a full night of sleep, when it downpours, when the traffic is terrible, and when our goggles fill with seawater. It will happen when it's 110 degrees on the competition floor, when we miss the lift, when we fail the rep, when the worst thing becomes the real thing. It will happen when somebody laughs at our ambition. Knowing things will go wrong is what keeps most people on the sidelines. Most people seek to avoid the struggle. But we are not most people. When the fists fly, we charge headlong into the fray because we saw the struggle coming, because we want what's on the other side more than we want to stay comfortable, because we know a secret. That adversity is the only shortcut to greatness, and it's a far longer road than most are willing to walk. When most people want to look better, we want to be better. When most people want to play it safe, we want to play it loud. When most people hope for the best, we expect the struggle, and we expect to overcome it. We know the road will be long and full of twists. We know our faces will become caked with mud. We know we will be tempted to quit, to give in, to stay quiet. We just start and we move and we fight, no matter the number of punches that are thrown at us. Because how do you defeat somebody who refuses to stay down? 